Hello everyone. Welcome to our Filming for Impact panel. Thank you all for joining us. I hope you all just raise your hand if you just saw the, the last films. Wonderful. Um, so this is the fourth uh, panel that we've had this weekend. And really excited to end our panel discussions with this amazing lineup of filmmakers. And um, I'm going to pass it over to Rick to um, introduce everyone. Hi, everybody. Is that on? Hi. Should be on there. Good? One, two, three. Very good. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, thanks for coming out. I know it's been a long afternoon. And, um, I want to introduce the panel right now. Far over on the left is Owen Bissell, and Owen will tell you a little bit about his background, but uh, he's a local filmmaker, wildlife filmmaker. And I know him when he was a young lad starting out. And Lisa is left here. She's done a marvelous film on the sequoias, on the redwoods. Again, local. You know this lady. <laughs> She's the uh, head, head doggy. <laughs> and on my right is Katya Scirocco, who is my partner and uh, co-producer of Alien Contact, the man's direction. So what we thought today was, you know, we do these films, and I have for a number of years from BBC to Geographic Discovery, and, and that's where they go out. And if you older people in the crowd here know that if you missed it, it was a geographic special or BBC, it, it never got disseminated anywhere else. You either caught it or you didn't, and maybe you got a DVD. Way back in the day, it was something even worse. And uh, it did, the, the longevity was not there nor did it get out to various what we call platforms, which we now know today is so important to reach the younger people and different generations. So, so that's so important in terms of making our films today, especially if it involves climate instability, climate change. How do we keep that message going and how we reach the greatest number of not just stakeholders, but people and, and younger people that they're inha inheriting the planet? So we thought, let's talk about that and not just, we make a film and that's great, you can win an Emmy, but you can't eat an Emmy and you don't change the world that way. So, so that's our, our topic today. So um, if you want, I can start and just talk about our newest film. So um, I don't know if you're able to run that a little bit, but <clears throat> our latest film is on salmon. And it's called Salmon and Ice. And, and salmon, we all know salmon, right? But do we? There are wild salmon and they're domestic salmon. And they're farmed fish. And almost everything on your plate today, except here on the West Coast in the summertime, is not wild. It's farmed. It's ranched. And it's not the best thing to eat. And it's causing huge problems in the environment. And it, this is our task, is, is to, to talk about how to save wild salmon and wild habitats, because they're so important in the overall ecosystem. But it's tough, because you know why? It's a fish, and we eat it. So we don't, you don't feel it cuddly, and it's not a tiger cub, and it's not a whale. So I'll show you a little clip of what we're trying to do, or we will, if you'd run that. Yeah. And, and we're up in Alaska, because most of the healthy populations are way up north in Alaska. This is, this is in the Copper River, a wild place. And it's glaciers, and it's ice, and it's cold water. It really fits our, our story. And there's seals up there. There's 5,000 seals living in there, and they're waiting for the salmon to come. So I've gone up to Alaska a number of times. I used to live up there. The other animals, like this bear, how did she know that the salmon were in this raging river? And she's feeling on the bottom of the salmon. So the salmon we thought were just really a good example of climate change. 
and, and the, the strong runs are still there in Alaska in some areas, but almost all the salmon that are in the wild today are from hatcheries. And that's not a good sign. And on the East Coast, we have the Atlantic salmon, and um, they're in trouble with hardly any commercial Atlantic salmon other than all that are raised in farms and pens. So the system is geared towards the salmon coming in and everybody wanting to eat them. And, and also for them, when they die, they leave their flesh and their nutrients in the water. So here you have harbor seal and seagulls. Seagulls are after in a mink, a little tiny mink attacking a full-grown salmon. You've never seen it before. Battle. Mink's like a vampire. Somebody I was working with said, we need more mink coats. I hate to say that. And Iceland. So we're working in the Arctic and we're working in both sides. As a little girl in Iceland, I grew up in the countryside. What I love is really being in so close touch with nature. It grounds me a lot. Wild salmon, when you see it declining, I think there's a huge issue to that and not being more concerned about it. I was always thinking about fish from very young age and, and Captain Fish. And this old guy was just staring at me. The old, ugly face of the males. You're always learning on, on the way things that add up to the total picture of their life history. A river without a fish is, is no joy. The whole idea is to be here and help and support the nature. I realized that it was time for me to rise. It was time for me to be heard. It was time for me to become a politician and figure out how I could help preserve as much habitat as I possibly could. greater audience and get this message out. Wow, that was beautiful. <laughs> Thank you for sharing that. Um, so we go from sea to land, although the salmon, of course, are a bridge uh, between those two landscapes. Uh, but the film that I just completed uh, last night, actually, <laughs> um, we did a little additional shooting. But it's about redwood forests. and. I have been wanting to tell the story of the Redwoods probably since I was 12 years old and I first stepped foot in Muir Woods and was just blown away by that feeling of awe and wonder. And in a lot of ways, that really led me to want to make films about nature. It just sort of opened up that curiosity in me and that sense of connection. Um, and in truth, this film was me indulging my curiosity about Redwoods. But I wanted to know a few different things. I wanted to know about the science. Like, how do they grow so tall? How do they live so long? How are they so resilient? I wanted to answer those questions on a deeper level. I also wanted to know how they work their magic on us. Like, why do I feel this way when I'm in these forests? And I had a chance in 1998, I was working on a, an environmental news series, and there was a woman named Julia Butterfly Hill, who was an activist who was sitting on top of this 1,000-year-old redwood tree to save it from being cut down. She was up there for two years. And I went up the tree uh, to interview her. And it, of course, it was just a magical experience to look out over the forest from that vantage point. But just talking to her and, and the community of people who were supporting her, it's like, wow, these people are willing to give all for these forests, risk everything. Like, what is it about us that makes us feel so connected to them? Um, 
So I got to answer that question in this film. And so I just sort of went you know, through um, these various questions and wove them all together into the tapestry that became this film, Giants Rising, uh, that touches on all of those aspects as well as um, the cultural connection between some of our, uh, the indigenous communities in California and these redwood forests. Um, and I think we have uh, the trailer here to play for you. like stepping into the pages of a fairy tale. There's nothing like being among the redwoods, the tallest and some of the oldest living beings on earth. Are you a queer kid? Having people spend just 60 seconds looking up at big trees made them less stressed, more compassionate. The trees give us perspective. They connect us to something bigger than ourselves. You do not need to know science behind any of this to be just floored. We are so close to being able to decode many of the mysteries about the biology of coast redwood forests. It may shed some light as to the nature of longevity in human systems. Multiple trunks are all interacting and communicating underground. Things are much more interconnected than we think. The biggest threat redwood forests face today is the legacy of logging that they're still struggling to overcome. The warming temperatures and the increase in fire, that is a situation that the redwoods might not be able to withstand. We're part of nature and part of the solution. I am compelled to tell their story, which is the story of our relationship with the natural world. So the film is uh, complete. Um, we're just doing a little update to it, and our social impact campaign is underway. And I guess we can talk about that afterwards. I don't know how you want to talk a little about what the campaign will be. And Owen worked on this film as well as many others. So it's Owen Bissell, and take it away. All right, yeah, I'm Owen, I'm local, um, and uh, it's a privilege to be here. About 20 years ago, I was actually Rick's student in Montana, and so it's kind of a fun full circle to be back here. Um, yeah, as a kid, I, I grew up, you know, like many of us, uh, looking at National Geographic, and I, I um, ultimately got into film to, you know, that would be the, the top goal to, to get something in National Geographic, and, um, uh, I can, I'll show this in a second, sorry, it's just ripped off the internet, but basically, you know, I, why National Geographic? Well, I thought, okay, I want to make an impact in the world, I want to help protect the environment, I had a science background as an undergrad, um, and so, um, yeah, so, so anyway, so uh, over, over the years, you work on a lot of different projects, and yes, I got to work on some National Geographic stuff, but uh, what often happens is, like Rick said, the television programs, they just kind of come and go, uh, but there was one group that I uh, have been privileged to work with uh, repeatedly, which is the, um, the society part of National Geographic, which it's their impact lab, and basically the impact lab uh, is the, the, the group that funds their explorers, and as part of those explorer grants, they incorporate media into the granting mechanism to get the story out so that it's intrinsic with the, with the, with the work that's going on. So the film and the, and the exploration are the same. Um, and so uh, one of the things about these well, I, maybe I'll sh maybe we can just play this clip, and then I, this, this is just like an excerpt from um, one of the many stories I've done. This is in Africa, 
um, uh, done as uh, funding for a Big Cats Week um, promo to promote conservation uh, on big cats, uh, specifically lions in this region of Kenya that have been affected really hard by climate change uh, and suffering a horrible drought, um, which just recently they got some respite from, so that's really cool. But this was done right at kind of the peak of the drought um, telling this story, so. It's one of the few places in the world where you can see livestock, wildlife, people all living together. That there? This is the land. But when lions are struggling to find food, they come into contact with local communities and often will target livestock. So Jenny said to me, if we want to stop people killing lions, we've got to engage this warrior demographic. He came up with our program, which is called Warrior Watch. For centuries, our tribe depend on their livestock for their livelihood. So as a warrior, we provide security for our livestock and protect the livestock uh, from land. We go early in the morning before the livestock are released and see where the lions are. We know the lions are in the area. We go back and spread that awareness within the community so that they can avoid those areas. The same style we use to kill the lions now, we use that knowledge to protect the lions. My tribe are very grateful for Warrior Watch program because that will save their livestock and also will save the lives as well. Yeah, so that was that was a, a really amazing experience for me. Um, but that project arose out of uh, basically when they initially uh, conceptualized the grant for Owasso Lions and, and the Warrior Watch program, uh, and Shivani, who was the, the woman there, um, and Jenneria, who's the, the warrior. Um, they had several plans already in place, um, and, the, and the key that they've told me, because uh, I'm not a producer, but is that they have the funding for all of the different avenues of impact lined up at the beginning of the project. So uh, basically, we had a TV spot, we had this seven minute film, they have a film that's still playing in the villages there um, in Samburu, uh, educating the, the, the younger generation as they come up. Um, and so it has this multifaceted approach where um, the same money goes a long way um, to, to making impact. So, yeah. Next we'll have Anna Blanco. So if you don't know her, she's the executive of this uh, festival. And she's going to talk about some of the projects she's worked on that, that were slated to be impacts. Thank you, Rick, and thank you for joining us today. Um, this is really exciting for me because this, um, I'm going to talk about um, our film, Sequoias of the Sea, and it's, um, it's my debut as a filmmaker, um, co-producer, co-director with Natasha Benjamin, my film partner here. And um, so our film is a work in progress, and we showed a 14-minute version of it on Friday afternoon at 4 o'clock here. And it's really exciting for me, after 14 years of watching hundreds and hundreds of films that have impact, to now be able to, um, to create our own story and at the same time develop our impact campaign as we go along. So it's a tremendous learning experience, but I also get to, to, to use everything that I've learned from watching all the films and all the films that have tremendous impact. So our film is about, it's called Sequoias of the Sea. It's about the disappearing kelp um, along the coast of Northern California. Uh, we specifically focus on Fort Bragg. Uh, there's a commercial sea urchin diver there who um, is being impacted by the loss of kelp. In the last 10 years, um, Northern California has lost 96% of all the kelp. It's rich in biodiversity. It provides an ecosystems for hundreds of um, animals and, um, and marine life. And it was caused by the warming of the water, um, as well as the sea star wasting disease. And um, it allowed, those two events allowed the purple urchin to proliferate 
proliferate and completely mow down the kelp. So if you look at the film or any current photo of what's happening uh, below the waterline, you'll see that it's a complete purple urchin barren. There is no kelp, basically. So um, we're documenting that from the perspective of Grant, the sea urchin diver, as well as Trisha McHugh. She's the kelp forest director of the, natural, um, the Nature Conservancy. And we're focusing on the restoration efforts that they're putting into place to help bring back the kelp. Um, and as I just said earlier, we're working on the impact campaign for the film itself, which we hope to be a 45 minute film. Um, and we hope to get it done um, in the fall. I could, um, you know, <laughs> after three years, you just don't know how long it's going to take to finish a film. So um, I'm very cautious about saying when it's going to be done. So we have a little clip here that we'd like to show. Thank you, Rick. A few years ago, these kelp forests stretched all up and down the Northern California coast, but they have been decimated. They are known as the redwoods of the ocean, and this is one of the last patches left. The destruction that's occurring is worse than the fire that burned down my house and 10,000 other homes in Sonoma County. How we would feel if we lost, you know, 96% of the big trees in the Sierra, that would be devastating to us. That would be front page news every day. The decline in the kelp has impacted, of course, our ability to gather abalone. Not being able to fish, not being able to, you know, uh, gather takes away our identity as a Pomo, as a tribal person. Without kelp in the ecosystem, it's made it really hard as a commercial diver. Kelp covers roughly a quarter of the Earth's coastline, and they grow up to two feet per day. They're one of the fastest growing organisms in the world. Everything in the ocean circles around this ecosystem. All the fish, all the marine mammals, all the invertebrates, all of them are here because of the kelp forest. We've had a few beds come back over the last year or two, but maybe 5% of what we had. For my daughter, it's, it touches hard because she was actually born at the spur of this whole disaster. My name is Grant Downey. I am a California commercial sea urchin diver. Our red urchin fishery on the Northern California coast has been declared a disaster federally for years now. Losing 96% of an ecosystem mostly hidden beneath the waves can be difficult to visualize. In 2015, most of it vanishes and then never recovers. But the kelp didn't just disappear. It's been devoured by purple urchin. Their natural predator, the sunflower sea star, was wiped out in 2013 by a pathogen. And are you seeing any return of starfish that is noticeable uh, <laughs> to help address this? So, um, not to toot my own horn, but I have found uh, the only two Pycnopodia sunflower stars that have been seen on our coast. Well, we need them. I found the one sunflower star, and that was amazing. Obviously, from my video, I'm like screaming underwater. We're all interested in finding the best way to restore kelp forests, and I think that's really what brought Grant and I together. I try to integrate where I'm at in my personal life, too, with where we need to go for kelp to make this ecosystem actually healthy again for, for him and for all of us. And, it's definitely humbled me quite a bit to have this experience paired with an environmental catastrophe. Scientists think bringing sea otters back, those little guys, may be one solution. What are the chances that the reintroduction area is going to be where that kelp's going to emerge that needs help? Good question. I mean, it's a crapshoot, but they're not going to be a magical solution. They're not going to transform the entire North Coast back into a kelp bed anytime soon. They're cute. We all love them, but, but we don't want them to strip mine, and let me repeat the term, strip mine the rest of the coast. <sighs> that was a long meeting. It was almost like a wake. Without food or drinks, it was like a wake. The end to the North Coast, if it were to really happen. So we'll, we'll start on more on the impact and, and what our... Oh, because we're not doing this? Yeah. yeah. What our ideas are uh, about taking these films 
and reaching a greater audience. And Katya will talk about what we're trying to do, what we plan, and what we are doing on the Salmon Project. So this is more on the impact and the campaign. Thanks. So uh, I should say, first of all, that um, as Rick pointed out, um, in the past, nat nature films, some really fine nature films, ones that really move you, that make you want to cry, make you angry. At the end of the film, uh, we as filmmakers and I as an audience member have, for those really great films, I've wanted to know what can I do? What can I do right now? Because the film has suddenly made a connection with me. I'm, I'm, I'm really motivated to, to help be a part of the solution. And until recently, filmmakers really haven't had a good answer for that. It's like, well, you know, climate change is screwing up the natural world, and I guess you gotta fix climate change. And those kind of answers really aren't good enough. H how can one person fix climate change? It's actually to the point of your board member this afternoon who stood up and said, well, let's talk about the small things, the one sea star we can find to throw back into the ocean. So. Um, um, we are at the beginning stages of production, uh, for into the first year of production in our film about salmon. The film is about how salmon might possibly uh, survive some of the, how some wild salmon populations might survive some of the impacts of climate change. So we want to, we have seen a glimmer of hope and we want to share that with our audience, but there's a lot of gloom as well um, in all of the natural world. And um, we are now trying to define more specifically, what's the message that we want to give? What's the takeaway that we want to give to each of our audience members? So that when somebody comes up to us at the end of a wonderful festival like this and says, well, Katya, what can we do? That we have a specific answer, like, don't buy farmed salmon. Uh, that is just one answer that we know we're going to give when somebody asks us the, at the end of our film about wild salmon. But um, we are now looking to uh, refine that answer much more in a much more sophisticated way by looking at uh, how how do we actually ask people to change behavior? How do we reach people that wouldn't actually not normally see a nature film anyway? Um, how do we identify those people and how do we uh, present the information that we'd like to share with them in, in places where they go and in modes that they, um, that they consume? which is a pun because any, anyway, and we do have uh, specific challenges making a wildlife film about an animal that we also eat, but that is uh, more our challenge than uh, the challenge of the impact campaign. So in our, in our campaign as we're developing it now for this film that will come out in 2026, we're working with an advertising agency and trying to be more uh, scientific about how, um, who do we want to take action as a result of watching this film? What action do we want them to take? What media do they consume? Do they even watch nature films? Do they stream them? Or do they look at uh, Instagram reels? What, where do they go? And try to reach them there, make short versions of our film in the places where they go uh, in order to try and change behavior. We're also working on how are we going to measure our success? Like, did we did we do it? Um, so these are answers that right now we don't have for our specific film. I'm hoping that Lisa, who's at the end of that process, knows more about how to reach people with the message, you know, the very fine message that you conveyed in your film. But we're at the starting point of that process. Good. I have a comment on that, Katya. So <clears throat> besides. Uh, uh, some that approach we I, I, I'm a strong believer in getting out into the public into the village into the community and giving live presentations and the feedback on that and we've done that for years even when I was at BBC they didn't tell us to do that but I felt that the outreach whether it's a tiny community in a native village in Alaska or in the Azores uh, show the film, show clips, talk about it, get it out there, and you get so much feedback then from from the audience and going to schools. So 
I think that's a key is get out there and and in your budget, in your campaign, have that as a line item, an important one of live presentations. And and you can't you can't beat that as far as I'm concerned. And the feedback you get and the comments and the questions, and especially with, with our younger generations, we don't even think about some of the ways they think. And that's the only way to do it. It's not gonna be on the television of a of a BBC special. You, we get we get Tremendous feedback right away from Blue Planet. More young people signed up to be marine biologists in the UK than ever before, and it was because of Blue Planet. But that kind of just died after a while. The momentum didn't keep going. So that's, that's where I'm at, because a lot of the people that we're dealing with in salmon, they're already converted. We're, we're talking to the preaching to the choir and not to the other ones. And, and you won't eat salmon. Everybody does, it's on every menu, just about in, the, in North America, Europe, whatever. And so we're not gonna say stop eating salmon, uh, farm salmon, just, just you know, working with other folks in that area is just clean up your act. Make it a better product. Don't pollute the, the, the waters. But if we're gonna have salmon, it's not gonna be eating all wild salmon. But we're saying, where they live, those wild habitats are really important. Whether it's taking dams down, or uh, limiting logging, or mining, or all those kind of things that lead to reduction in salmon populations are key. So that's what we're up to, and we're learning as we go along of new ideas, new ways. Because when I came up in the business, it was one thing. Film was on TV, boom, that's it. No, no feedback. <coughs> Um, I guess I'll go next. Um, so as I mentioned, Natasha and I are um, working on our film, and it's um, we're in the earlier stages than Lisa is on her film. So for us, it's really about incorporating um, the idea for the impact campaign as we go along with making the film. Um, we've talked about using snippets of the film um, and using it on different platforms, as Rick said, whether it's social media, um, and any other platform that we can find to reach different audiences, right? Everyone takes um, their intake of media in various different ways, and there's so many options now when you think about it. Um, and the idea is to reach the, the younger generation. Um, so we're in the process of developing our impact campaign, and one of the things we want to do is to take it to a lot of cities up and down the coast of Northern California and just educate people and let them know that this is what's happening. Happening. Um, I will take a minute and share one film because we've had so many in the film festival uh, between Collision, Freight, and Sand Wars, if anybody remembers those films. Um, we had one called Straws. And I believe it was in 2018, it was a film by Linda Booker, and it was based on the footage that was just taken randomly of um, the marine biologist in Costa Rica, and they found a turtle, and the turtle had a straw up its nose, and then they extracted it, and Dr. Christina Pfluger, and it was amazing, it went viral. Everybody saw it, everybody understood how bad plastic straws were. So the filmmaker made um, the film, titled Straws, a lot a history about straws and a young kid in Costa Rica who said he wanted to do something and teach people not to use plastic straws. So once that film got developed, um, it's been in hundreds of schools across the country. It also helped lead the effort to um, pass legislation to ban plastic straws. I think California, San Francisco might have been the first, California, and then cities across the country followed. And it was that one snippet of a video that was caught that was then made into a film backed by science, backed by um, the history of a plastic straw, which started when we did um, when we did drive-throughs, you know, fast food drive-through. That's how many plastic straws got started. So for me, that's kind of one of the best examples of a film that definitely had an impact campaign that led to impact um, and that led to real change um, in, in our world, in our community. And you still see it happening today. So 
I first just want to say that uh, Rick had referenced the Blue Planet um, film series. I'm sure you're all familiar with it. And it's not dead. It's still playing at the American Museum of Natural History in their Hall of Ocean Life. <laughs> because when I got there in 2003, they had hired me. I was working at National Geographic at the time. They had hired me to come in and work on this exhibit hall. And they wanted to add a lot of media. And they wanted to do all these things. But they had no money. But I knew, having been at National Geographic and in that world, that there was all this footage out there. And why not take that existing footage? We don't have to go out and film it all again. And so I connected with the person who is the executive producer of that film and said, hey, what do you think of this? And 22 years later, for better or worse, the film is still there. I mean, it's throughout the entire exhibit is all this footage. And I, it's really about leveraging content, right? There's a lot of effort and money and resources poured into making these spectacular films that not everybody is going to sit and watch, right? And so there are so many different opportunities to kind of slice and dice them and find ways to get them out to all different types of learners, all different types of audiences. Um, but there, the channels for doing that have not been clear. Um, and they're, they're getting a little bit clearer, although the funding's still not there. Um, so for Giants Rising, um, I actually uh, worked with a, I'm working with a social impact strategist um, who is helping me sort of figure out all of these wonderful venues that are out there and how to do that, whether it's through community screenings, um, whether it's through educational resources, things that you can do to take action. We actually just had a public art event last night. Uh, there was an artist featured in the film whose ambition it was to take a life-size 310-foot portrait of a redwood tree and project it on an urban uh, building. And she did that last night at the Ferry Building. Um, and it was fantastic. And it brought together this whole other kind of community. And that experience, you know, combining the, the media with the experiential. And those things are what's memorable. And it makes people, huh you know, kind of take a moment and think about, okay, well, how is this affecting me? And what is that saying to me? And what do I want to do with that? And then to Katya's point, like, where do you go from there? And so with our project, we've really kind of identified three uh, sort of strands that, you know, we want to work on to help sort of move people in those directions. And one, firstly, just get out into the woods, right? If this film does nothing else other than remind people of how awesome our forests are, it doesn't have to be redwoods, right? Just that feeling you have of being immersed, you know, cultivating that fascination and, and rekindling that connection is going to get people to care. And that is, if you don't have that, no one's ever going to do anything. So that's number one. We want to get more people out into the woods. Number two is we want to drive more support to conservation um, and restoration. And in that, um, we are developing partnerships with organizations that are already doing it. How do we amplify their message, whether it's, say, the Redwoods League or Sierra Club or, or universities where research is happening that could really make a difference? How do we, once we get people's attention, we get them in conversation, we start talking to them. We have resources on our website. We have our partners cross-promoting. And we start to reach a much wider audience. The third part for us has been um, more support for the integration of uh, indigenous knowledge and experience into the management of our forests. Um, and it was very exciting um, that one of the women, uh, a woman who was featured in our film, uh, Rosie Claiborne from the Yurok tribe, um, has been, you know, they've been trying to reclaim some of their lands in the Redwood National uh, Forest area. Um, Redwood National Park, excuse me, and uh, just a few weeks ago, the national, the government gave them back their lands, which includes this new gateway to Redwood National and state parks, which is amazing, right? Right? Now, we didn't, that was happening. I just happened to step into that and film it. But now we have a chance to amplify what they're doing and help them make that a model for how other parks are managed, state parks, national parks, right? So now, together with the Yurok tribe, with Rosie, we can work together to figure out how to take that to the next step. So it's really exciting. There's a lot of fun things that can be done. It takes resources, <laughs> um, which I have some of. I'm lucky enough to have that. But 
you know, it's um, it's like a, doing a whole other film all over again. It's this whole other um, job, but it's very rewarding. And I'm going to say, well, what's your plan for an impact campaign? What would you do? You, you've got you've got a film you've wanted to make forever. Just Rick, and, I, yeah, I'm I'm, a, I'm the carpenter, not the uh, architect. No, no, no. <laughs> that, that, um, yeah, I yeah, mean, yeah. you would you, like I said before, you 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 have to put the you have to put the the marketing strategy into the initial budget, and part of that um, is when you go out and shoot your. The, so speaking more from my perspective as the camera person out there with the thing in my hand, you know, I have to basically think about all of the different strategies, all the different places that the film is going to be going while I'm shooting. So you might be shooting for the theatrical part of it, but you also are maybe shooting like a vertical video for the social media platform. And then at the same time, you're doing an interview for, you know, radio. Um, and part of that is that, you know, filmmaking, as we all know, you know, this, we're all trying to save, we're like trying to save the world out there, but filmmaking is a very extractive process. I mean, we, we fly all over the world. We spend a lot of, you know, money and, and gas to do these things, to bring these stories to people that need to be told, but it is, it is um, difficult. So you want to be as efficient as possible when you do these things. Um, the other thing, and I'm, I'm skirting your question a little bit here and maybe putting myself out of a job, but one of the things that a lot of these groups are starting to do is work with local uh, uh, filmmakers and so you know a group like the National Geographic Labs or uh, I keep calling it a lab but it's their it's the um, impact group it's a it's a media group and um, anyhow they um, they've started programs to help uh, mentor and bring up filmmakers within the, the the country or the you know in situ basically where where the projects are happening so um, that reduces the the uh, the cost, the, the way that you can leverage your your skills, uh, and then um, also it, it probably I mean it definitely uh, imparts a bit of um, local perspective, which we wouldn't have otherwise coming from from our 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 spot over here. So anyway, so just summary very quick, and then we're going to have audience questions. So think about your question. Are you expected so? So Owen's saying one of the key things he's saying we're going to work with local young filmmakers or local film as well as citizen science. Mm -hmm. that, that's key. So that would be one thing. Lisa, give us one of those zingers that you would think are really important for an impact. If you had one thing that you had to hang your hat on on that, what would, what would it be? Partnerships. Partnering. Yep. With Fine. everybody you can. That, can make a difference, right? That you can collaborate to amplify okay. the message. Okay, Anna. I was. Um, thank you. I was going to say exactly the same thing. Partnerships. I think the key word Lisa's been using here is amplify. Amplify the message in any way you can. And we, um, Natasha and I actually have been working on some grants to solicit funds to be able to take the film on the road to various communities, um, including the, um, the tribal um, Indians that are affected by this as well, and to educate them and tell them what's going on with the urchin. Um, but for us, it's partnerships. And we made this long list of all these people that we could collaborate with for showing community screenings um, up and down the Northern California coast, and there were so many of them. So that's part of the goal is to, to, to work with other folks. Okay. Katya? So I would say that um, the time is past for talking about big, fuzzy ideas. I would say that the most important thing is one concrete takeaway from your film, which whoever's film it is, like do this, don't do that, something that every single person in the audience could do today. Like with the straw example, stop using plastic straws. Yes, there's much bigger issues about plastic pollution, but my goal with our next film is to have some specific small, individual, bite-sized takeaways that every person in the audience can do if they wanted to. And my suggestion is that go find other sources of funding because the broadcasters aren't as keen as they say they are. It's a lot of lip service. They want to do it, but how? But there are 
you know, individuals, NGOs, uh, associations, groups, if, it, if they're involved or interested in what you're doing, try to go and canvas them, to try to go in and uh, meet up with them and, and, and use that, use that ladder as a way to get to a greater audience too because most of the time you're going to spend most of your money on the film. But then it's a, it's a serious thing to get out and, and run a campaign. So we've learned uh, more and more lately that we have to find other sources of, of funding. And, and that's not always going to be knock on the door at BBC and say, oh, we want to, oh, we, we're going to do this, but we need another million dollars to do whatever. And they're going to say, oh, great. You know, thank you very much. So, so that's my takeaway. But now it's the audience turn. So don't just sit there. <laughs> well, you can sit there, but uh, questions. Here's one right here. He's used the mic so we can All right. So because. Tell us who you are. Pardon me? Who are you? Oh, my name is Victoria Lilienthal, and I'm a good friend of Rick and Katya's, so I'm thrilled to be here today uh, to see all of your film clips. Um, since I had the opportunity to see your kelp, um, kelp film earlier this afternoon, I thought it was incredibly useful, and this is my question, to see Nature Conservancy on a baseball cap and to see her talk about Nature Conservancy because as a viewer who has a donor advised fund mm -hmm. and I'm looking to give to things like Save the Redwoods already but I'm being educated about a kelp forest that I didn't know was in the kind of condition that it is in a place that my family's lived for five generations. That's a devastating piece of information. What can I do? Nature Conservancy is right there telling me I can give. So is it gratuitous as a filmmaker to put a cue, a visual cue in for your viewer that immediately lets them know here's a place you can give. Not just don't eat farm salmon, which I 100% agree with. I think it's a phenomenal message um, because too many buffets across the globe are serving it. But is that, that was really helpful to me. And yeah, I couldn't agree more. Um, and just to clarify, um, that film is not our film. Um, it's called, that one's A Disappearing Forest, and it's done by Tyler Schiffman, who's a good friend of ours. Um, and so it's not our film, but I couldn't agree with you more. But ours is Sequoias of the Sea, which was on Friday at 4. Oh, OK. So this one you is have the same guy speaking the scene? Yes. <laughs> OK, well, yes. then I'm confused. Yes. But anyway. Yes, right. yes. Grant has become a little bit of a, a he's been he's an, an excellent spokesperson, not only because he's um, he's doing rest restoration work, but he's also very involved um, with the community meetings. And as you saw, he was there with Jared Huffman when Jared Huffman went and did a town hall. Um, very um, articulate about the issues and really knows how to um, and tell the story and, and tell the impact that it's had on him. Um, but the Nature Conservancy, that's an excellent idea, you know, is to have somewhere where people can um, identify with an organization where they can give their money to. Um, we had a film earlier um, called Orca Black and White Gold and the filmmaker couldn't be here. Um, and yesterday she sent me this QR code and she said, can you put the QR code up on the screen so people can follow the story and follow with what they can do to help tell the story about the orcas. And unfortunately it was a little too late. We couldn't get it up there. But she was definitely trying to reach out to help us amplify the story of what's happening with the orcas um, with that particular film. So as soon as we get somebody like Nature Conservancy to fund us, <laughs> we'll put their logo everywhere. <laughs> can, I, uh, can I add something to sure. that? You know, one of the things is that the, when, when ideas come across your plate and you're looking for stories, quite frequently they're tied to an organization that is doing cool work, right? So, like, I mean, I can't tell you how many films I've been a part of where it's like, okay, we're making this film about this group doing this really cool work, but how do we make it not just like a, a promo piece for the organization? And so 
furthermore, like if you're, you know, if you're, if Nature Conservancy is in the front of your imaging, then um, sometimes going out into festivals, and luckily there are places like this where we can watch films like this, but sometimes that's actually a, a mark against you because you, they don't want to, they don't want it to seem like a, a promo, right? And so you have to be very, very careful about that in terms of the way that you're approaching, you know, the, the groups that are involved in your film, even though your film is, is owes its genesis in a lot of ways to those groups. So that's just something I would add. Yeah, and that's very true. And we get a lot of films where it, it's borderline promo for the organization. So, uh, but I think this one, the one you're referring to, a disappearing forest. I thought they did it nicely. So. Yeah, if your your film's going on PBS, you have to be very careful of all that. We just can't do that. Uh, send money to the film or, or whatever. But Victoria's question is really good. Is okay. I watch it. I'm interested. I want to help. I want to do some. Is I think that the as as a, a viewer, you've got to dig deeper into who the right group would be or individual. But I also someone. think it's. I, I also think um, in in the specific situation you're asking about. I think it would be the duty of the filmmaker to say to to. Mm -hmm to make you be sure that that's the right group. So at some point, maybe at the end of the film, however they want to get the message across saying, you know, if you want to, if you want to help kelp, donate to, to, to this part of Nature Conservancy. That's, that's a duty of the filmmaker. He should have put it in his And film. it may not be always money. It should, it's citizen science and get out there. Isn't there now uh, interest in, in groups of divers being out. You know, I wouldn't want to organize that, but everybody on the bottom pounding sea urchins, we did that decades ago, but there, there are these uh, subjects and, and issues that, that need more help. But, and it's not always money. But it's Sometimes the duty, it's our duty as filmmakers to be really clear with that message, and we haven't been yet. Uh, yeah. That guy wasn't clear, with all due respect. Okay. To, you know. There's a question in the back. Yeah, can, yeah. Um, uh, Thank you. Uh, given, given that the, the cleanups are going to be of a variety of sizes, and um, uh, some are going to cost more than others, um, how would a, a local community try to start off with uh, ballpark um, estimates? How could they get ballpark estimates of what a cleanup would cost? And, and obviously that's going to be an individual. Can you be a little louder with the mic? Or uh, sure, yeah. So when a, uh, when a community hears what needs to be done right. or just learns about the kind of conversations we're having, uh, as a next step, somebody's going to want to know roughly uh, what will it cost. And that's just a starting point. And it's not a fixed number necessarily. But how do they get a start in talking to people that says, um, we've seen cleanups like this, range of costs could be X or Y, mm -hmm. is at least as a starting point to then start um, asking funders um, to, get, to get going on it. Um, I think that's a great idea, and I think it's the one thing that most people don't end up talking about. You know, when you do a film, or when Natasha and I, when we were seeking funding, you know, putting that number on the table is a little scary. Um, you're not sure if it's going to be the right number, if it's too big or too small, but you have to start somewhere, you know. And so, to your point, if it's a beach cleanup or any effort that the community is going to get involved in, I think telling them and educating them and, and just using a point of reference is what it's really all about. Um, and having some number that you can share that's going to say, this is how much this is going to cost us to do, and so this is how you can help. Yes. I was just going to say, you know, also I think it can be the filmmaker's role to help facilitate the connections to get you the answers to those questions, right? Like, I'm, I'm getting a lot of sort of random emails through our, the film's website, which are wonderful, but all sorts of questions. But now, because I'm at the sort of epicenter of the, you know, save the Redwoods kind of world, uh, I know where to send them. Like, here, talk to them. They're in your zone. They're, they're working on this. Or here, you know, go here. And then you can start working on the ground and find out more about like what it would cost to roll forward with whatever action the community wanted to take. 
So this is all real good information for me too, as uh, my name is Leanne Lindsay, and I've been producing radio, podcasts, I've got a film in post-production, right now a feature-length documentary, but I've been also trying to save a radio station, a public, an independent public radio station up here on our coast at the south end of Mendocino County uh, called KGUA, and we are now going to do some programming that because we've done ocean symposiums every year with our connection with the ocean community, we are going to do some more um, programming around nature-based solutions, economy, those kinds of topics. And this helps me think in the planning process of all these radio shows and podcasts for sure have that impact baked in. What action can they take even at the end of each radio show hour? And these are we, we're doing those live and then I'm editing those into a podcast format. Now for the film that I'm doing, it's not in the ocean category, but it is in the horse-human connection. And and also horse-assisted therapy for special needs children. So I'm wondering, you know, if when, while it's in post-production, we're now going to be working on this, the distribution plan and the marketing and the impact campaign. Can you get distributors to help with that impact campaign? Or is it just a separate money-raising thing? Because I'm I've been raising a lot of money, so I've got to say, okay, now I've got to raise more money for the impact campaign for that, too. So I'm trying to raise money for both sides. So I was just wondering if distribution would do that. <laughs> so I, I, um, I think it's hard to find uh, distributors who will take that on. There probably are some um, who will take it on, but it's probably not their priority. Um, and so I, you know, and we touched on this earlier in the conversation that, you know, probably finding partnerships with um, groups who could support that impact campaign because it's in their interest too um, is a way to go um, and, and have it sort of be a separate element. But I think there's all different ways that it can be. Um, you know, these kind of collaborations can happen. And my, my hope is that places like National Geographic is already sort of on to this, right? Like, hey, all these pieces need to come together if, you know, this is really what it's about, but not every place is National Geographic. And um, yeah, I don't know. Do you guys think it's changing at all? Uh, well, just just a comment to, to to you is um, I think you always have to um, think where the other side is coming from. So a distribution company makes its money um, exists because it takes a percentage off of your work. That's their job. It's a really useful function. They, they don't really make money off of an impact campaign, at least not yet, at least not as far as I've been able to understand. So you have to meet people where, it, you know, where it's mutually beneficial. So it's really your partners. So that's, I would agree with Lisa that, well, all right, but maybe the therapeutic writing associations, you know, they would love to have a video clip and maybe they can support you in expanding. Just, so just, just to say. I just want to add a comment um, that I think some, I think it was Lisa who said that she's working with this, um, an impact campaign person. I think if every filmmaker who does these films has the ability to put it in as a line item, um, because what happens, and I see this happen a lot, some films have the best intentions to have an impact campaign, put a lot of money into it, fantastic film, and then undoubtedly filmmakers move on to the next film. and. Um, their impact campaign doesn't doesn't happen. It doesn't occur uh, because they didn't in in the beginning create a line item for it in the budget. They didn't turn it over to somebody else who could do it for them. Um, and you know they have bills to pay, so they're on to the next film. And I see that happen a lot. So um, hopefully, even in my own case, we can add a line item for uh, someone to manage our impact campaign. So Question. some. Hi, my name is Rachel. I've really enjoyed the sessions today. I have two questions, if you'll let me. One is, how do you choose which stories to tell in factoring in impact? For example, yeah, uh, for example, the example with the 
turtle and the straw, like that's, there's some stories where that's very clearly applicable versus the sea kelp. Clearly that's an important issue, but I can't personally, or I don't feel like I can personally take action to, to solve that. And the second question is, a lot of these changes can come from like policy levels of governments implementing policies to outlaw plastic straws. So have there been any um, considerations or work on like tying films to petitions or tying like films into like government oriented policies or impact? Yeah, well, uh, that's, that's really important, the, the government and, and policy makers. And, and that's not always easy to get to those folks. Uh, you, you, that's picking the subject that you know might raise their antenna. And that, that's really key. I know with salmon that I was in Iceland and this battle's going on between farm fish and wild fish because they're both very important in the economy. <clears throat> the prime minister, of she of Iceland came down this river where I was filming this chap and we started talking a little bit. But when I said climate change, her ears went up. That meant, you know, there's a real possibility there that she's going to run with it. If it was just this political battle or economic battle between how many jobs are going to be here and how much money, but when it's something bigger and, and she's getting a lot of heat on, in terms of the schools, children, but the politics is, is key. And uh, another example, I've worked a long time in Costa Rica and the group I was with, the foundation Mar Viva, wanted to save an, an island off Panama called Coiba Island and it was up uh, it was a prison island, huge island, uh, wild, had more, more big trees and bird life, but Carlos Slim, one of the richest men in the world, a Mexican, was going to make it a, a, uh, a destination for, you know, hotels, everything, everything. So our foundation, one of the things, our, our uh, uh, main guy, he went, he went to the with the president of Panama and and to the public. And we went out on the public because they were didn't care about Coiba Island, but putting out TV spots, 30 second spots about this place called Coiba that they thought, and they had learned from little kids, that that's, that's the, the prison island out there. We don't care what happens to it. And so we started educating that way. But behind the scenes, his lawyers and he and other things saying, hey, if you don't do this, I'm going to take my business out of Panama, and they started listening, and and then and then we had a major screening at the new Miraflores locks in Panama at the Panama Canal. They invited all the environmental ministers from different countries in in Central and South America, but it was an overall push, and and it was key to get to the politicians by, hey, if you don't do this, the votes aren't going to be there, or the money's not going to be there to help, and they, they listen to that. So you're right, a lot of subjects are not going to draw that interest. Uh, you, you, it's, it's, they may not be interested in a frog until you decide and show them how important a wild frog might be. But lo and behold, it worked, and this huge island down there is today a national park. And it wouldn't have been. It would have been developed, it would have been, you know, a condo, swimming pool, golf courses, whatever. But it took a real concerted effort and time to figure out the game plan, how to do that. And that's what we're trying to do with salmon. And with salmon, I'm amazed at how many groups and, and across the North America and Europe, fly fish, sportsmen, this commercial, and they don't all work together. And that's one of the things that there's these competing groups always. You know, if you want to see that, when I was in the Alaska oil spill in Exxon, the minute the oil spill hit, all the groups were up there trying to raise money. You know, it was a feeding frenzy. And they wouldn't even have been up there if just the oil spill they were using that. So you have to be, have a real plan and talk it over and say, and is this the subject we want to tackle? And if we want proper funding for a film and a campaign, uh, we got to pick the right topic. We got to pick redwoods. We got to pick something. We got to pick lions. We have to pick whales. Unfortunately, a lot of times if it's a big ecosystem, that's difficult. People don't get that concept. So that's key in, in your planning. There's another questions? Yeah, right here. All right. I don't know. Um, is, is this the right yep, distance? Hear you. All right, good. Uh, 
<laughs> Sorry. I usually talk without one of these things. Um, to deal with some of the points, uh, you know, you need to find the subject. How do you, you know, you picked your subject, now how do I structure your film so that at the end that makes the impact you want so that you can sell it? Because some of the programs earlier today, I was lost. I, I find they weren't structured to give me the impact at the end for, for what they were trying to talk about. I, I, I'm going to address that um, as I'm approaching the field from a business standpoint. So the idea of creating an impact campaign is quite new in the field of nature films filmmaking. Um, most films are actually, uh, probably most of the films that Anna has in her festival were financed by broadcasters or um, by private interests, you know, who, who didn't necessarily ask for an impact campaign. So the great majority of films are actually made to tell a story about the natural world or the ocean and they don't have, you know, a call to action. So that's probably why some of the films that you've seen so far didn't, you didn't really ask you to do anything except just enjoy. Right, but how do you structure it so by the end you have that if that's what you want? Do you start with an introduction to the problem? Or is there a flow to your film? There's a hundred and one ways to tell a story yeah. about the ocean. So I think each, each, the art of each director and each writer is, is going to be different. You know, I think that's the, uh, who your team is, who's on your team, and uh, obviously not just the scientists, because they may not see that, but the writer and the producer, and know that that's one of your goals from the get-go, without being it, without it sounding like a, you know a info commercial. That's the key. That message has to be subtle through that. We tried to do that at BBC for a number of years and not hit the people over the head because the minute they start hearing, oh, oh, here's another environmental message, and they've done, you know, a lot of a lot of work on that. You take your remote and turn it off. The public doesn't want to hear it that way. But if you subtly work that through, and and then it, towards the end. The, the culmination of your story, then it's going to come out without having to say, now you see this, you see this, and you see that. You know, um, I'll just give an example of the of the right whale and the, and the uh, seagull today. You know, how many times did they have to show the seagull pecking on the whale and over and over and over until what it does is then there's a negative feedback, right? Instead of hitting the message you want it, you know, it, it, they all don't have to be 50 minutes or an hour or something. These shorter films can be very powerful. Mm -hmm. And I, I was going to bring that film up. It's called Why Blame the Seagulls. Um, and it was on the 4 o'clock program. But I think what the takeaway from that film for me was simply we need to raise awareness about this problem. There is a problem. This takes place, I think, down in Chile. Um, and it's an open landfill. So the garbage truck comes. It just dumps you know, um, garbage. And it attracts the seagulls. And the seagulls have now started pecking on the whales, right? And it's just horrific, and they won't close the landfill. And for me, I know the filmmaker really well, it was just astonishing to see that happen. I mean, the whales are now, they know how to curve their backs so that the seagulls don't see their backs um, and to prevent them from getting pecked on. So a lot of films are simply about raising awareness. There might be a problem that needs to be solved. There might be a problem that would solicit an impact campaign. But I think until you really understand what the problem is, you can't really make a movie that is has a direct call to action. And some of the movies are simply, you know, here's this problem. Oh my God, who, we, who would have known about that? Nobody knew about it, right? And so a lot of them are simply to raise awareness. And as we move down the road, then, you know, there will be more films and there'll be more ways to create impact campaigns, in, in my opinion, from what I've seen over the years. So I just want to add also that, you know, with documentary filmmaking, you, you step into the idea in your head of what that film's going to be, and sometimes you end up in a very different place. 
because what is revealed to you are all these other stories. And so I may have gone in to making this Redwood film thinking, well, it's just about protecting the Redwoods and restoring them. It turned out it was about much, much more than that. And it's, it's just hard to tell these stories, right? We find all these strands, and then we have to figure out how to weave them together. And we're not directing people in terms of, okay, say this, or say this, or say this, you know, as best we can, you know, to be able to get, you know, these, um, these narratives uh, to have that flow. But it's trial and an error, it's, it's hard. <laughs> um, and some, Films are gonna hit and you're gonna walk away from them and be like, oh yeah, I got that. And other films are not gonna resonate with you, you know, and it's just like anything. It's like, you know, someone who writes a book. It's like you throw it out there and you say, This is important to me. This is this flow feels like it brought me on that emotional journey. It might not work that way for everyone. They might not feel that impact, but you just gotta kinda put it out there and hopefully it'll scoop up some people and some people will go, Oh yeah, I get that. And, and now I want to do something because of it. Okay. And, and some of the film, just briefly, we'll go, like the first short clip by Paul Nicklin, you didn't have to have that, you just look at those images and look at the magic of Antarctica, and you get it. You don't have to say, you know, you get it. This is some place that we need on Earth. And, and it, the images spoke to you, and him being there. So. You don't have to be so devious and crafty about, oh, I have to get this message through. Make a damn good film and people are going to enjoy it. Up back there. Oh, I just would, I was going to ask you guys yeah. to, on the same topic. You know, er, earlier, Katya, you mentioned, I want the one key takeaway, right? And, and that idea with, I mean, we've all seen it, you know, you watch a film and like Lisa said, we meander through this discovery process as we're making the film, but if you can at the end of the film or somewhere in the, like, in the process say, what's the point of your film? Like, what is your film? Like, in one line, like, nobody else is going to be able to follow it either, you know? And so, you need to be able to, like, pin that. So my question was, and you mentioned this earlier, at what point, or does it change, when? what's the key takeaway? Now, that's a little different than what's the film, but that, that point of, um, what's my key takeaway? When does that come up for you, you guys, or you know, in in making the in the film? I'm just gonna say it come it comes up right at the beginning when I'm doing the pitch. I typically pitch to broadcasters. <laughs> I got to say it to them right away. This is a film about this, and they'll either get that glazed look and say, "Oh well, actually we have 12 of these already," you know, <laughs> and I, or they're like, "Oh, they lean forward," and then you know you start. So yeah, that's a really good point. Um, I think that at, at, I will confess that in the past we have had a lively discussion about what our film was about. <laughs> as one does. <laughs> as, as one does. Uh, and by lively, I'm I'm eu euphemistic, but uh, as, when I say lively, yeah. 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 Curious, what part? Uh, a protagonist plays typically in your films. The, for me, the story arc is super important, but how do you feel about how critical that is where maybe people are or are not educated about a subject, but following somebody who's sympathetic, um, and how, how important is that to you in telling your stories? I'll take that a little bit. So it's, it's historically we did, nature films were, in different categories, some that had humans in them, and then there were blue chip without humans. And that's what BBC went for for a long time. But now we, we certainly know humans are part of the environment. And people like to see people involved. So, so we certainly look for characters that'll fit in, that feel natural in there, and we haven't manufactured them, or they're not a movie star, or they really have a calling and a purpose. So if you do find a, a, a scientist that can either quirky or good on camera or something, that works. And, and the same with uh, other individuals. So it's really hard to find those people. We also have these mandates. Indigenous people should be in that because in a natural history film, because they're, they're, they were here. They were here and, and we messed it up, <laughs> you know, we. And, and also in terms of diversity. We've seen enough old guys with beards and hydrophones 
and binoculars, throwing them in the water and looking at whales, really. And, and I was part of that as an old guy. But not, and so th that's really, really tough. I mean, we, we, with our Manta Row show, I, I'm really not thrilled to be on camera. But if I'm in that, if it's a journey, it, it certainly helps to, to, to knit it together and not all those cul-de-sacs we run down and those strands. Because when the editor gets going, they're going, this is beautiful. I don't know where to put this. It doesn't fit with the story. And you're, as a cameraman, you're going, yeah, but it's such great behavior. So as we're filming, and Owen was saying, we have to think about the edit and how that sequence will go together and will really fit. And a lot of cool things never get in the film. So that's one of the things we're thinking about today is having, along with our major film or films, having shorter, shorter films, two minutes, five, and get those out right away. Don't wait till the film's done because it's not going to detract from the film, but it'll, it'll generate interest. And people lose interest that you work with. And they're going, well, hey, you were here three years ago. Where the hell is that film? And, and we used to imagine film when we shot on film. That was huge. They never got to see anything. Today, you can sit with your video camera, at least show them and get people excited. You imagine we come up from a dive or see something great, and we're telling the captain or the scientist, and they're going, oh, yeah, yeah. And we're, we said, well, they couldn't see anything. And then the film had to go to a laboratory and be processed. Hopefully, it didn't get x-rayed. And then it came back. <laughs> and so it was weeks, months. And so, and you didn't even know if you messed up. Technically, so it was tough, but in the answer to your question, it depends on that subject. If you really have some humans that will help that story, put them in. Put them in. And then the editor, you'll feel how much they should be in there. We kind of minimize that part because we're, we're, we're more interested in the wild, the environment, the habitat. But as Katya said, we're right away we're going to say wild salmon, wild habitats matter. And if it matters, why? And I would say my approach has been a little different, sort of protagonist first. That, you know, I have a topic or something I'm interested in, but for the kinds of films that I have mostly made, it's really about do we have someone who we can connect to, whose passion for a particular subject is contagious, someone who can is working on something and their, their dedication to it is just going to suck us in in a way like, we don't care about doorknobs, but if you're passionate about it, you could get me to love doorknobs. You know, like, it, it, it just, it's true. And, you know, through the process, this is one of the hardest, I would say one of the, the aspects of the story development process that is the most fun, meeting all these interesting people, but one of the hardest things is saying, okay, now which of these people are going to make it in, and which am I going to have to say bye-bye to, because they don't fit in that narrative. And I, even up to the 11th hour in making this film, I was cutting people out, and I, and I felt terrible, because they had taken their time, and, and it was great. And, I, and what I say to them is, you're another story I'm going to do, because I want to tell your story, you know, about, you know, whatever it is, but it's not this story. Um, so, but there's so many different approaches, as Rick was saying, like if you're doing a straight natural history, it's, it's very different, but, you know, but it's, for me also, when you have the merging of the two is when um, you can just keep people captivated, um, a, a sort of wider audience than just the natural history alone. There's audiences for both, but when you bring them together, you get both audiences, hopefully. And, and I'll add to that. Um, in our film, and it doesn't come up in, in this clip very well, but um, we had five uh, submissions of kelp film this year for the festival, um, and we ended up showing two of them. Our, our fuller film is going to have more about the, the tribes, the Pomo and the Sherwood tribes, um, that are reclaiming their access to the ocean and how important kelp and abalone is to them. It's fascinating. Um, there's a reef check taught the young girls, these young women, how to go scuba diving. And their reaction to seeing the kelp is just amazing. So in terms of a protagonist, it's fantastic. And we have a great editor. And after he started doing some work and, and, and showed us some clips, he ended up putting more about the tribes in our film than we anticipated having in there, because it was a great story of them and how the loss of 
kelp is impacting them as a culture and just their, their daily lives. So um, I think it's really important. And Grant, of course, is such a fun-loving, affable kind of guy. He is being impacted by, uh, tremendously, his income, um, and, uh, and, and so he's trying to find other ways to, to support his family by doing the research and doing the restoration work. But so between the two of them, you know, it's, it's true, you, you have to let some people go and some people you definitely want to have in, in the film. So it's challenging. But it, it makes the film. It makes the story, actually. So I could add one, one last thing, too, which is that uh, what I've seen, I, personally, I've seen, if you have a good character, like, you have a short, like, immediately. Like, it doesn't even matter what the topic is. Like, a good, interesting person on camera will almost always be a good film. But specifically on the short, you know, duration. If once you start getting into the longer film, um, you have to have good characters and you have to have a good story. Otherwise, it doesn't. You know, it's not enough. Basically. Mm -hmm. She was a question. Okay, so um, my name is Cassandra, and um, I want to address the question from early on about engaging young people as audiences. Um, I'm a professor of art, media, and design, so I'm working with young people. Um, my own work, I do experimental documentary forms, and my research areas are uh, embodied uh, immersive experiences. <laughs> so I teach a lot of AR strategies, VR strategies, documentary games, um, and talk to the students about transmedia. So does film go away? Absolutely not, but it can be integrated with those other ideas, particularly with transmedia. Um, then, I mean, if you think back before AR, VR, when I was a kid in the 70s, there was Star Wars, right? <laughs> and I had my Star Wars lunchbox, I had my Star Wars sheets, I had my Star Wars, like everything, my Star Wars Halloween costume. So if you can break the film, think spatially, beyond the frame and break the film out into the world. Um, I think that's a really good way of having impact because we all remember Star Wars, right? Or I, I'm a Duolingo addict and that little owl from Duolingo like texts me all the time and tells me I haven't practiced today. So I think that's really good in terms of impact um, strategies, but also, um, with the games, I'm working on my second uh, virtual reality documentary game. and. I love that games allow for embodied participatory learning, um, so you don't just walk away from it. Mm -hmm. You go back to it, you go back to it. And particularly when you're talking about the environment and climate change, these are systems-based problems, and games allow young people to think through systems um, in a way that's active instead of passive. So I'm happy to talk to you more about that you know, like things that we're working on and things that we're doing. Um, but those are, those are some suggestions. Games, trans documentary games, augmented reality, because that can incorporate video, so you don't have to, you don't have to stop doing film. You can bring film into the augmented reality. Um, virtual reality tends to be more computer generated. The 360 film fad didn't really go anywhere. <laughs> but uh, yeah. No, and what, what you said is, it's game changing for me. No, in term, no, in terms of not to be smart, uh, with younger people, we need a salmon ga game. You know, a salmon game. You know, follow Sally Salmon, whatever, and what all the issues. Yeah, no, that that. So sit there. That's why I'm really appreciative that you said that. It's a light bulb. Say, because because we're working with very creative people, and that has longevity, right? And it and it resonates with the younger people. You can talk, you can talk. <laughs> One more question. You guys can Thank you so much. Um, I had a question specifically for Lisa, but maybe we can open it up. You mentioned you're working with a social impact strategist. I'm curious if there was anything particularly surprising from working with someone like that um, on your impact campaign, if you had any aha moments. Um, She's here in the audience. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. You don't have any problem. <laughs> so uh, Lindsay, who's sitting here, is the um, social impact strategist that I've been working with. And um, she was asking me about it, you know, what kind of aha moments I've had from working with you. And the biggest aha was I thought I could do this all myself. Mm -hmm. It is like making a whole other film. 
I mean, it, it, it is all encompassing. There is, you know, there are so many opportunities, but to be able to identify them and then to nurture those relationships and then figure out which one is going to be the best for this particular um, impact that we're hoping to have. It's, it's complex and it takes a lot of thought and, and you think, oh, well, yeah, well, I'll just, I'll just do some educational stuff, I'll make some educational videos. When you bring someone in who has that experience to understand what is really going to work for that particular audience that you're targeting um, and, and the best way to support them and amplify their message, it's different for each one, but I, I mean, I can't recommend enough if you have you know the wherewithal to bring someone in with that kind of experience to at least strategize at the very beginning um, and and if you can keep them on because it's a lot a lot of work but it's this is where the impact gets made so I mean you should hand your card out to everyone <laughs> I'm just kidding but it is it's it's it was really eye-opening to to um, to be able to work with her and really a blessing Good. Thanks, everybody. Huh? Thank you. Thank you.